They claim the soul Bible has outlived its day. That there are some changes that need to be made. Let no man to see. Make your Bibles or turn with me to Matthew 24. Truth is determined by the test of time. Trust the old Bible to tease and mass. Never mind those people who won't throw it out. Churches are drifting and falling away. We need the soul more than ever to Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you're choosing to listen to this broadcast. This is Empty Cross Ministries Basic Bible Study, and I'm Brother David. I'm going to be your host and fellow student for the next 30 to 45 minutes or so. We're going to be looking at the minor prophet of Jonah, the second chapter of Jonah this evening. We are up with the broadcast every Wednesday by 9 p.m. I prefer to record it earlier in the day, but it is always up by 9 p.m. Just a little note there for you so you can adjust your schedule to when you want to listen to the broadcast. Before we get to the scripture, I want to read Psalm 116, a few verses from it. Kind of set the tone for the, for the, for the lesson. Psalm 116, verses 1 through 14, beginning in verse 1. I love the Lord, because he hath heard my voice and my supplications, because he hath inclined his ear unto me. Therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the pains of hell gat hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord, and righteous, yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low, and he helped me. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with me, with thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed, therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, All men are liars. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. <clears throat> Once again, we're going to be looking at Jonah chapter 2. Excuse me. We'll be looking at Jonah chapter 2, and we will get to the scripture here in a few moments. Taking time and not finding time. In 1884, the American Christian Review released a prayer experience between Jacob Creath Jr. and L.B. Wilkes that took place in 1854. As recounted by Wilkes, the location was LaGrange, Missouri, where Wilkes had come to preach. After breakfast, Creath invited Wilkes to take a walk into a nearby wooded area. Stopping by a fallen tree, Creath said, Let us pray, according to Wilkes. My soul trembled with excitement. Brother Creath talked so to God that I voluntarily felt for the moment that if I should open my eyes, I should certainly see him upon whom no one can look and live. I never heard such a prayer before. And now 30 years have passed since that remarkable experience, and yet I have heard no such prayer since. In today's world, it is very difficult to have a quiet nook in the woods in which to pray. The important thing is to pray regardless. Busy schedules tend to squeeze prayer out of daily life. This is the only way to pray daily. Take time to pray, for there is no such thing as finding time. Don't be like Jonah, saving your most earnest prayer until a crisis forces it from you. Instead, pray without ceasing 
as it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. The background for this week is the same as last week, so I'm not going to go through all that again. But you may have, uh, but last week may have made you wonder why. Why was Jonah so determined to disobey God by not going to Nineveh, a major city in Assyria? One definite reason is given in Jonah chapter 4 verse 2. Some students offer the further possibility that Jonah, as a prophet, did not want to associate with idol worshippers. Furthermore, there had been military conflicts between Israel and Assyria, of which Nineveh was the capital. This may have caused Jonah to dislike the Assyrians. That is speculation. But a review of the former campaigns between the two nations provides probable cause. During the years of Jonah's ministry, in the 8th century BC, Assyria was having internal problems and was not a threat to Israel. The actions of the past, however, we were remembered. Some of the people involved in those wars could have been alive during Jonah's lifetime. The prophet's hometown of gath Heifer was in northern Israel. We see that in 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25. That is a region more likely to have experienced conflict with the Assyrians. Jonah may have had relatives who fought against them. In 853 BC, about 75 years before Jonah began his prophetic ministry, King Salmanzar III, and he is not mentioned in the Old Testament, he had attacked the coalition of 11 or 12 kings that included King Ahab of Israel. Assyrian records... Assyrian records proclaim Shalmanazar to have won the resulting battle of Karkar. The losses he claims to have inflicted on the coalition include 2,000 chariots and 10,000 men of Israel. Actually, it appears that the battle was indecisive with the Assyrians advancing no farther that year. It is very possible that some of Jonah's relatives of a previous generation fought the brutal Assyrians in that battle. In 841 BC, Shalmanazar III again flexed Assyrian power against Israel. His famous black obelisk shows Jehu of Israel bowing before him, although some think it is a representative who is bowing. Another king of Assyria reigned from 811 to 783 BC. He received tribute from, jo from uh, Joash, father of Jeroboam II. Jonah prophesied about events and the reign of the latter. We see that in 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25. Considering all these factors, it is quite plausible that Jonah and his fellow Israelites had a great disdain, even hatred, for Assyria. Jonah would rather go anywhere than to those despised people. And that brings us up to our scripture. What we're going to do is we're going to be the entire scripture, then we'll go back, break it down, verse by verse, and bring those verses to life and show how God's word is applicable and relevant to our lives today. I am reading from the King James Version. I need to make a note here. You do not have to use the King James Version. Use whatever translation or version of the Bible that you feel comfortable with and that you can relate to and that you can understand. Once again, we're going to be reading Jonah chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice, for thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought me up, yet... Hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God? When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, 
and my prayer came in unto thee, and to thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord, and spake and the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Our key verse would be Jonah chapter two, verse nine. I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. First section of our scripture could be titled Descriptions, okay? Verses 1 and 2 are Jonah in the fish. Verse 1, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. Jonah had been invited to the sailors' prayer meeting. Look at Jonah chapter 1, verse five, verses 5 and 6. We covered that last week. But there is no record that he participated by offering prayer himself. Also, it seems quite doubtful that Jonah prayed concerning his decision to go to Joppa to find a ship and his plan to flee from the Lord. Therefore, what we see in the verse before us is the first recorded, is the first recorded prayer by Jonah in the book that bears his name. Jonah has had the thrill of being cast overboard into the raging sea, sinking into the water, and then being swallowed by a great fish. Only after all that do we find a record of him praying. Here and in Second Chronicles chapter 14, verse 11, are the only two places in the Old Testament where the exact Hebrew wording translated unto the Lord his God is found. In both cases, the prayer is offered by men in situations of life and death. Dire situations often compel prayer by people who do not have a prayer as an ordinary part of their lives. They anticipate positive answers and often they almost challenge God to hear and heed their prayers. And that brings me to a what do you think question. What do you think? What steps can we take to avoid an act now and pray later mindset? What about clarifying the value of self-reliance? What about distinguishing boldness from rebellion? And what about to better understand the power of prayer? Let's think about those things as we go through our scripture. Verse 2, And said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Seeing I cried, cried I, may make us wonder if two prayers are involved, or if there is just one that is described twice. Behind the two translations, cried, stand different Hebrew words. The two words have a lot of overlap and meaning. But the one behind the second translation of cried is more intense. The same pairing of Hebrew words with varying English translations is found in Psalms 18, verse 6, Psalm 28, verses 1 and 2, Psalm 119, verse 146, and verse 147, and Isaiah chapter 58, verse 9. In all these cases, the reader detects, even with no knowledge of Hebrew, a heightening of intensity as the thought moves forward. We see this heightening in the verse before us as Jonah's cry, by reason of his affliction, is followed by his affirmation that he even cried out of the belly of hell. The second phrase obviously more pointed than the first. For its part, the Hebrew word translated hell occurs dozens of times in the Old Testament. Hell is the translation about half the time as here, with grave the translation in almost all the other examples. Look at Psalm 31 verse 17 for an example. In a very small number of cases, the translation is pit. Look at Job chapter 17 verse 16 for an example of that. The wording leads some to think that Jonah was actually dead when he uttered his prayer, and then he was resurrected when the fish expelled him. 
Most, however, see the phrasing as Jonah's way of describing his circumstances as being very critical. The most important thing to Jonah is that God does indeed respond to the prayer. Now we come to verse 3. In the sea. Here Jonah is in the sea. For thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. As Jonah piles up descriptions of his ordeal, we see expressions set as parallels with one another. Into the deep, into the midst of the sea, floods, billows, waves, compassed me about, passed over me. Not to be missed, however, is Jonah's acknowledgement of the ultimate power behind the prophet's ordeal. It is the Lord. Thou. The hands of the sailors had thrown Jonah overboard, but the hand of the Lord was behind theirs in doing so. Jonah further affirms that the entirety of the watery environment that resulted belongs to God. Thy. We see thy twice there. To acknowledge God is a first step of repentance. Let me say that again. To acknowledge God is a first step of repentance. The prayingest prayer. The poet Sam Walker Foss, he lived from 1858 to 1911, is best known for such work, for works such as The Coming American and The House by the Side of the Road. A lesser known poem is The Prayer of Cyrus Brown. In that work of 24 lines, a deacon, an elder, and two ministers give their opinions in exalted language regarding the best posture for prayer. The deacon advocates prayer while kneeling. A minister disagrees, contending that prayer should be offered while standing with arms outstretched and eyes lifted toward heaven. The elder is damnant that praying with eyes closed and head bowed is the proper way. The second minister opines that prayer be offered with hands clasped in front, thumbs pointing downward. Having heard all of this, plain spoken Cyrus Brown offers an entirely different perspective. His own praying his prayer occurred when he fell head first down a well and became stuck in that position. For both Cyrus Brown and Jonah, the desperation of their respective situations overruled issues such as posture when praying. But if situations of absolute desperation are the only times we pray, well, what do you think? The second, second section of our scripture could be titled, Despair. We now come to verse 4, and it could be titled, Away from God. Verse 4, Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. Jonah is fully aware that his own rebellion has caused him to be cast out of God's sight. Compare this with Psalm 31 verse 22 and Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 15. <clears throat> As his strength fades, Jonah seems to despair, at least briefly, of ever again having fellowship with God. Yet at some point during his despair, Jonah expresses hope that he will someday be able to look again toward God's holy temple. We wonder if this refers to the temple in Jerusalem, even though Jonah is from the northern kingdom of Israel. Look at 2 Kings chapter 14 verse 25. Note that 1 Kings chapter 12 verses 28 through 30 records Israel's worship centers established elsewhere over a century before Jonah's day. The reference may even be to God's presence in heaven. Compare this with Psalm 18, verse 6, and Hebrews chapter 8, verses, verse 2, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 and 24. And this brings me to another, what do you think question. What do you think? How do God's ways of getting the attention of the wayward influence your service for him? How do God's ways of getting the attention of the wayward influence your service for him? What about as he gets people's attention through godly people and or 
holy circumstances? What about as he gets people's attention through ungodly people and or unholy circumstances? Think about those things. We now come to verse 5. Jonah's covered by water. Verse 5. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. Jonah uses Jonah uses three vivid images to describe further the apparent hopelessness of his situation. The similarity to Psalm 69 verses 1 and 2 is noteworthy. We now come to verse 6, and we're going to break verse 6 down into two different sections, okay? First part of verse 6 is down to the lowest, okay? Verse 6, the first part reads, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Jonah's plight is described in language that reminds us of the mountain ranges and deep canyons that lie beneath the surface of the oceans. The people of Jonah's day have never seen such things, of course. So for Jonah to say he went down to the bottom of of the mountains may reflect his assumption that the lofty heights he sees on land continue their descent below sea level. As Jonah looks back on his on this very as Jonah looks back on this very recent experience, it seemed at the time there was no way out of a situation, since the earth itself seemed to have <coughs> barred any escape. Finality is expressed in the time factor of forever, but then the impossible actually happened. We now come to the second part of verse 6. And the third section of our scriptures, and that our third section could be titled Declarations. Okay. Second part of verse 6 reads, Yea, hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. God rescued Jonah in a way that is beyond what anyone would have imagined, since this is believed to be the point at which the fish swallowed him. Thus he has a reprieve, he has a reprieve from death. Is it possible? Is it possible for a great fish to swallow a man? Many skeptics react to this event by saying that it is not only unbelievable, but impossible. Some question whether such a fish ever existed in the Mediterranean Sea. Fake stories of modern-day Jonas do not help. For example, a story circulated several decades ago... Sorry about that. For example, a story circulated several decades ago about a man named James Bartley who was swallowed by a whale near the Falkland Islands and lived for 18 hours before being rescued. But a researcher debunked this story in 1991. He discovered that the ship in question had not had, not had anyone named James Bartley. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> He discovered that the ship in question had not had anyone named James Barkley as a crew member. The wife of the ship's captain said this in her letter. There is not one word of truth in the whale story. I was with my husband all the years he was in the ship named the Star of the East. There was never a man lost overboard while my husband was in her. The sailor has told a great sea yarn. <coughs> Given the decisive evidence for the bodily resurrection of Jesus, it is a very minor matter for God to have a fish swallow a man. Jesus even connects the two events in Matthew chapter 12, verses 39 and 40. We also know a connection with Psalm 103, verse 4. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction. The word destruction there and corruption here are varying translations of the same Hebrew word. Which brings me to a what do you think question. What do you think? How do your own experiences of deliverance enable you to help others in distress? What about regarding spiritual experiences? What about regarding financial experiences? What about regarding relationship experiences? Think about those things. We now come to verse 7. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. What are one's final thoughts just before death? Jonah recalls his thoughts to have focused on remembering the Lord. 
These thoughts had been in the form of a prayer that ascended into God's holy temple. Jonah can affirm this confidently because of the flow of events that follow, in which light he pens the verse before us. Hitting rock bottom. Have you ever hit rock bottom? We experience moments when it seems as if the whole world is conspiring against us, times when there is no relief in sight. Often, however, it's not the whole world conspiring against us, but a case of being our, our own worst enemy. Addictions to drugs and gambling are examples. People with addictions may sound sincere about their desire to get on the road to recovery, but often that won't happen until they hit rock bottom. This expression means that a person has reached the point where one's own coping mechanisms have proven insufficient. At such a point, the addict may realize that there is no hope for recovery without turning it all over to God. At some point, Jonah realized that he had hit rock bottom. His coping mechanism of fleeing from God had failed, stripped of the possibility of rescue, either by his own strength or by that of other people. Jonah realized there was only one source of help that remained, the God from whom he had tried to flee. Most of us are not mired in addictions, nor nor are we in Jonah's predicament. But we can learn from his experience. The ironclad rule is this. When God taps you on the shoulder for a task, turn to him for help right then and there. Don't flee first and ask for help when things seem hopeless. To do so is to repeat Jonah's error. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 11 and 12. And that brings me to a what do you think question. What do you think? What are some ways a church can help those who have hit rock bottom? What about concerning Christians that are in such a state? What about concerning unbelievers that are in such a state? Think about those things. We now come to verse 8. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Jonah has received a great act of mercy from God. In the midst of such a deliverance, the thoughts of the prophet turn to others. He has learned a great lesson, and he writes to warn that to practice idolatry is to observe lying vanities. Compare this with Psalm 31 verse 6. To walk in one's own way instead of God's way is to forfeit. God's mercy. So Jonah still has the heart of a prophet and that he has concerns for others, especially it seems for those who worship fictitious gods. The only true source of mercy is the only true God. Brings me to another what do you think question. What do you think? What specific steps can we take to avoid the lying vanities that trap so many people? What about concerning temptations of power? What about concerning temptations of possessions? Think about those things. Comparisons have been made between Jonah's statement and the verse before us and the context between Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. Elijah was a prophet in Israel before the time of Jonah. In the Mount Carmel situation, the Lord demonstrated his power over the idolatrous Baal gods. This was a great vindication for the person and the preaching of Elijah. Look at 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 20-46. through 46. Both events involved water, but in entirely different ways. Elijah had water poured over the sacrifice three times, and then he prayed. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. That's 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 38. The backdrop to that comes the backdrop to that contest was a three-year drought. In both cases, God's answers to the prayers were dramatic. We come to verse 9 now. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Jonah Jonah plans distinct responses in light of God's dramatic display of mercy toward him. 
The sailors had offered a sacrifice when they were delivered from the storm, and Jonah intends to do so in light of his own deliverance or salvation. Sacrifices involve animals, however, however, and Jonah has none with him at the moment except the great fish, which has him rather than the reverse. The only material possession he likely has is his is the proverbial is the proverbial shirt on his back. Therefore, his sacrifice while inside the fish will take the form of the next best thing, the voice of thanksgiving. Compare this with Psalm 50, verse 14, Psalm 69, verse 30, and Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. Jonah affirms also that he intends to pay what he has vowed, but we don't know exactly what that vow is. While on the verge of drowning, Jonah may have made a promise to do something should God deliver him. This is not a case of foxhole religion that wanes as soon as the battle is won or the crisis is over, however. As a prophet, Jonah is well aware that when thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not slack to pay for it, to pay it. For the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee, and it would be sin in thee. That's Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 21. And we now come to verse 10 by the Lord. Okay. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. The book of Jonah is different from other prophetic books in that it is largely a narrative. Most of Jonah chapter 2 breaks this pattern with the narrative resuming here at chapter 2 verse 10. The expression, the Lord spake unto the fish, is probably figurative. This form is used so the reader will understand that what the fish does is by God's control and direction. There is certain irony here. There is a certain irony here. When the Lord instructed Jonah to go to Nineveh, the prophet disobeyed and went in the opposite direction. By contrast, the fish obeys God. We normally associate vomiting with the body's natural rejection of, rejection of something due to being sick with the stomach flu or having consumed something indigestible or in excess. A long-standing humorous observation is that a fish can stomach a backslider for only three days before it becomes sick. However, the expulsion of Jonah upon the dry land is by the Lord's direction, not natural body, not natural body, bodily reactions of the fish. Anyone who has experienced a storm on a lake or an ocean recalls the great sense of relief when reaching land safely. How much more Jonah must have must be relieved given the extreme nature of his experiences. Our sanctified imaginations tell us that this is the time for the prophet to offer his sacrifice with the voice of thanksgiving. Jonah's water tests Jonah's water tests are now behind him. The remainder of his test will be on land. One outline of the book of Jonah is offered this way. Chapter 1, running from God. Chapter 2, running to God. Chapter 3, running with God. Chapter 4, running ahead of God. When we see this sequence in the life of Jonah, it can cause us to reflect on which of the four states we are in right now. At the midpoint in our four lessons from Jonah, we see that the prophet has learned the hard way that it's better to run to God than from him. It's been said, there are two ways to learn things, either by wisdom or by experience. The former is learning from the mistakes of others. The latter is learning from our own mistakes. So which will it be? Shall we, shall we in wisdom learn from Jonah's error, or shall we by experience learn the same lesson the hard way? Let us pray. Almighty God, keep us attuned to your word so that when you call, we will respond. We pray this. In Jesus' name, amen. As we close out here, I leave you with this thought to remember. Run to God, not from Him. Stay tuned next week, next Wednesday, as we 
look at Jonah chapter 3 and we'll be talking about forgiving love. You notice uh, the title of today's lesson was Preserving Love. Next week the title will be Forgiving Love. Stay safe, be blessed, stay in the Word, and write the Word upon your heart. And we're going to close out with the song we opened up with. It should come on here in just a moment. Once again, be safe, be blessed, stay in the Word, and write the Word upon your heart. That there are some changes that need to be made. Let no man to see. Take your Bibles or a turn with me to Matthew 24. Truth is determined by the test of time. Trust the old Bible with these and that. Never mind those people who won't go down. Church is hard to be and fully know it. We need the soul more than ever to be. But tampered with the Bible and with the Bible. Nothing is sacred, no one will choose to Our way of life is changing, and people don't care. The signs of the end, they see everywhere. Trust the old Bible, it's the ancient land. Never mind these people who want to wear out. Church is our drifting and falling away. We need the sober for the better to do. They've criticized my mind and signed dirty through. Some say it's inferior and simply do not live. They've tried to replace it and shove it aside. But God is exalted, He said it will abide. Trust the old Bible with these old maps. Never mind those people who want to live out. Churches are drifting and falling away. We need the soul for the heavenly Jesus is coming to judge and decide. He will return to his heart is right. The Bible is sacred, holy and grand. And those who defile it, no fear will they stand. Trust the old Bible with things and vows. Never mind those people who wander around. Churches are drifting and falling away. We need the sober 